Okay, so uh, welcome back. This is part two of adding drum pads to other things that don't have good drum pads. So um, as promised in my last video, I picked up the Akai MPX-8. That's this little black box here. And uh, it is an instrument by itself. It is actually a uh, mobile SD sample player. So basically you load your samples onto an SD card, put it in here, and then each of these drum pads can play back your samples. So in, uh, in that sense, there's a little bit of overlap with something like the model samples in that you bring your own samples uh, and you make music with them. However, what it can do with those samples is very, very limited. So in terms of the capabilities of the MPX-8 as an instrument, uh, it, they're not amazing. Like it can do a bit, if you're considering this as an instrument, do your research, it has some very, very serious limitations. Um, it's, yeah, it's very basic. The model samples on the other hand can do a whole ton with samples uh, and it really is like truly an instrument. You can do a lot with this. But the reason that I wanted to pair these two is because I wanted to bring these drum pads, what I consider to be better quality drum pads, to the model samples. So I'm not, these are the audio outputs on the MPX-8 right here. Uh, these are balanced, by the way, balanced quarter inch outputs, um, but I'm not even hooking them up right now because I'm not using this as a sound maker at all. So I'm using this purely as a MIDI controller. Um, it's getting its power over USB. Uh, I don't even remember if it does MIDI over USB, but if it does, I don't care. I'm not using it. Um, I'm currently powering it from a little power bank here. Um, if you wanted to, you could easily power both of these things off a single power bank with two USB ports. No problem there. I'm just doing them separately. Um, so we want to get these two to talk and be friends. How do we do that? Well, what's really great about this MPX-8 is it has native MIDI in and out ports. Um, this is using TRS, uh, so MIDI over TRS. Uh, TRS is tip ring sleeve or just your standard 8 inch stereo audio cable, what a lot of people would call an aux cable. So this is a super easy cable, cheap, small, um, you know, I mean, you can you can buy these real cheap. So this is really great compared to full size MIDI cables that are a lot bigger and heftier. So for this particular combo of these two, they both use MIDI over TRS. So all I need is this one little cable. So I'm just gonna go MIDI out on here to MIDI in. on the model samples, and there we go. And so now, with no further configuration, so uh, I lied a little bit. There is some further configuration needed, so let me just demonstrate what it would be like out of the box here. Okay, so with no configuration, it does this. All right, the pads are laid out um, chromatically, same as these buttons here. Right, so, um, and that's cool. Uh, you can definitely use this to chromatically play uh, any of the tracks. And note also when I switch tracks, right, it automatically is just controlling whichever track is there. The reason for that is because uh, the Akai MPX-8 uses channel 10 for, as the auto channel. Uh, so when you're going MIDI out on this, it is channel 10. No matter what, you cannot change it. It only supports MIDI channel 10. <laughs> um, the model samples will support any channel you want, but by default, it has MIDI channel 10 set as the auto. Let me show you what that is in the menus here. So if you go into the MIDI menu and then uh, in channel and scroll all the way over to auto in, you can see by default, it's on channel 10. And um, I've also noticed like I have the uh, the Volca sample here, and I'm planning to do the same thing with the Volca sample. The Volca sample, um, by default, uses um, actually all 10 MIDI channels, MIDI channels 1 through 10, corresponding to the different tracks. Uh, so that will not work out of the box. So for the Volca sample, you actually have to use Pagen's custom firmware, which has an option to do the same thing that the model sample is doing here, of using solely one MIDI channel, which you want to set to MIDI channel 10, to be your auto channel. Um, so what this means as an auto channel, is it, it is automatically mapping whatever your MIDI controller is to the um, to whatever your tracks are here. So again, by default, um, this MPX-8 is configured to send note values, which are going to allow you to play whatever track it is chromatically. And as you switch between tracks, 
right? It's, it's just automatically going to be controlling whichever track is active at the moment. So that's cool. Um, but what I think is more interesting is doing this. Right. So um, ignore these two for a minute, right? Because on the model samples, I have six tracks. And on here, I have eight tracks. So I have two, or I have two, eight pads, I mean. So I have two extra. So for now, ignore these two pads, and we'll just look at these six. So the way I map these is one, two, three, four, five, six, all right? And notice I don't have to switch anything around, right? So the way I'm doing that is that the other benefit of this auto channel is if you look at like a piano keyboard, like down here, if you think about the lowest possible notes on a piano keyboard, on a full size 88 key piano keyboard, the lowest possible note um, is gonna be a C, um, but it has a MIDI note value of zero. So MIDI note zero is the lowest possible note on a piano, 88 key piano keyboard. MIDI note one is the second to lowest, MIDI note two is the third to lowest, etc. So since you start on zero, you have to kind of take whatever number it is and subtract one from it. Because here we're counting from zero, here we're counting from one, track one, track two, track three to six, right? So all I had to do, um, I'll, I'm, I'll just go to a new kit to do this fresh as if it's brand new, all right? Um, so right now I'm back in my chromatic mode. So all you have to do is on the MPX-8 here, um, using the select keys here, I'm doing select minus until I get down to this very last value, which is mid, M-I-D, stands for MIDI. Um, so by default, it's set to 36, which is a note on uh, the keyboard somewhere in the middle, right? So all I'm gonna do is crank that down to zero. There we go. And you can see as I turn this up, right, I can control each one in series if I get it right. <laughs> Uh, so even if you, you don't want to memorize the numbers, it's fine. You can just kind of guess and check. Be like, all right, I want this to be my track one. All right, now this one is, now all the rest of these are still doing the chromatic thing. So let's set all these two. So this one, I'm going to set it to the next one up. Okay. And then this one, next one up. to all the way to the bottom and then add a couple. There we go. So all you have to do is look at the track number, subtract one, right? So track three is MIDI note two, for example. Uh, now, I'm going to do the same thing where I skip these, go to this one here. So, here it is. No, too many. Okay, I'm on that one. No, okay. I had it. Okay, there we go. So, ignoring these two. Right, so I can now play all of these at once on this one pad, which is great. So what do we do with these extra two pads here? Well, you could do nothing with them. You could just ignore them and have them mapped to nothing. Um, but uh, since they're here, I figure we might as well use them. I think a good use for them is to make them um, uh, be part of that chromatic keyboard, uh, like kind of the original default. So I'm going to go back to my kit where I've already got that set up. Um, well, uh, whatever, we could just do it here on the fly. Okay, so by default, so this one is set to MIDI note 37. I'm not even sure what note that is, but it doesn't matter. You see, as I scroll through, it's gonna change the pitch. Let's get something that's easier to hear the pitch on. See, if I go all the way down, I start getting other notes, right? But as long as I'm above uh, six, I guess, or no, I guess it's when you're above 10. When you pass note 10, 11, 12, okay, 12. 12 is the first, the lowest possible note you can play. Right, so you could just tune them by ear like this. Right, and same here. So these can be whatever you want. Um, what I did on my little kit here, um, so the MPX-8 can store kits, which is supposed to be like storing your arrangement of each sample, uh, but I'm not even using the samples here. All I'm doing is basically storing my kit of however I want this MIDI information uh, saved. So I'm going to go back to my kit one, which is kind of the way I want it. So the way I have these, this one's set to MIDI note 28. This one's set to MIDI note 48. And what that corresponds to is an octave down and an octave up. So if this is the, the basic tone, this is an octave down, basic again, octave up. 
right? So to me, that seemed uh, kind of like fun and you know actually musical. But the interval you're choosing here is arbitrary, right? So I chose an octave, but it could easily be a third or a fifth or whatever you want it to be, right? Now, in the case of the model samples, it is monophonic per track. So if I hit, even though all three of these are currently controlling track three, if I hit all three, it's only going to make a single sound because the model samples is only cap capable of making one sound per track, right? Now, if I had a polyphonic thing here, then I could actually play chords that way, right? So that's cool, just to point that out. Um, if you have something that does uh, polyphonic, you can actually build chords in this way, which, for example, the Volca sample with Pagen's custom serve, uh, firmware does have a polyphonic mode. So maybe there's a way to do that. I'm not totally sure. I haven't dug into that yet. Um, so anyway, uh, here we are. Um, in my opinion, this really opens up the model samples here uh, because the onboard drum pads, as I said in the last video, are just not very good. And these ones are so much better. So um, let's go through. I think I actually already have a little sequence on here. Let's go ahead and just erase that and make something new. Cool. Okay. So here's my sounds. Um, so how how am I going to play this? Well, of course, I could just live play it as an instrument, right? But um, what's great uh, is that I can use the sequencer in the model samples here kind of in conjunction with this live play, right? On its own, the MPX-8 has no sequencer. It has no looper. There's no way of getting it to play itself. Like you literally have to tap the pad every time you want it to make a sound, right? So that's, you know, can be a good thing, can be a bad thing, depending on what you want to do. But um, that's one of its major limitations as an instrument. Model Samples, of course, has one of the best sequencers out there. So um, the easiest way to do this, I found, uh, is just to do live record mode, right? What I'm going to do just to give myself a little bit of a metronome, let's pick, all right, we'll do this clap. I'm going to give myself just a four in the floor metronome to play along to. I just find that helpful. It does have a built-in metronome, but I just prefer using a track for that. So, okay. So uh, now, yeah, let's just play something in. So I'm going to switch into live record mode, and notice I'm doing it unquantized. When you tap this twice, let's stop that. So when you tap this, oh, okay, <laughs> you switch between quantized and unquantized. Um, I want to do unquantized because for me, kind of the whole point of getting an external drum pad set up here is so that I can get a bit more of the kind of human feel and human timing into my my sequences. Um, whereas like if I'm just inputting them here on the step sequencer and then maybe like playing with nudge and stuff like that, I find it a little harder to get that that natural uh, kind of swing to it. So, so we'll try it this way. That's quantized, there's unquantized. There's a thing. So let's turn off this like metronome track and do something else with that one. So uh, track five here is my pad right here. Uh... Okay, cool. So we'll stop with that. So um, notice when I wanted to play track uh, six, which is this, that sound, right? I switched to that so I could use my two octave up and octave down pads here to get a little more, more variety, right? And I've also noticed this, if you want to add, you know, a fourth note to be able to quickly play, you can still use the default pad here, right? So I'm just going to go function track, go down to what note this is playing. So this is currently set on G7 for some reason, um, which is not the default. The default, I think, is C5. So I'm going to set it to... Oh, let's say, uh, let's say E5. Okay. Okay. Right. right, 
So you can change whatever your kind of your bass note is there. This one I'm going to say for this particular sound is a bit too low. So let's go here and just quickly tune that to be something else that I want it to be. Okay, that sounds good, I think, maybe. Yeah, I think I liked it better here. So on the MPX8 here, right, each number, each MIDI note is, is a semitone or like a half step down. So um, just like going up the, the notes on a piano keyboard, right? So it's pretty, um, pretty easy for Western scale kind of stuff at least. So here we go. Um, let's uh, let's see if I want to add something else. Let's see if we can get rid of these notes. Okay. Now, did you hear it? Let me mute all the rest of these. So on this little um, kind of synthy bass one I did, so hear how the volume changes. Right, on that second note, and that is because the velocity on that one is 19 versus this is like 127, that's max velocity, 127, 127, and 127. So the drum pads on this are quite sensitive, uh, far more so than your onboard ones here, right? And what that means is that you can generally get a much bigger spread of like a low velocity to a high velocity. Now, because I'm used to playing on these super hard drum pads, I'm hitting this one way too hard and I'm getting max velocity too often. And that's something I just need to practice at. So I need to practice on having a lighter touch with these. All right, you can do a lot with that. And just to like show this here, let's switch to say this kind of hi-hat sound. Oh, this one. Right? Because the pad's so big and so sensitive, you can do these kind of quick little, like, more complex rolls and stuff like that. If I try to do that on this pad, nothing. No response. With the same, you know, roughly the same velocity I'm hitting it with, there's no response. To do it here, I have to slam on this thing. <laughs> Look how much it shakes the table. So it just doesn't it just doesn't work. Now, take all this with a grain of salt because I'm not an experienced finger drummer. Um, but the point of me buying this MPX8 is that I want to start learning finger drumming. I want to start integrating it into my music because um, I find that when I purely sequence my drum patterns, they can just be a little bit too robotic. And the model samples has a huge array of ways of you know, helping with that, right? A nudge being a big one where you can take things off grid. Also chance where it'll like randomly drop notes for you based on a percentage, both super useful and I use them all, all the time. But even still, I want I just wanted a bit more than that. So for you know the cost of this, about $300, the cost of this. So retail price on this is $110, um, which I think frankly is a bit high for what it is, for what it can do. Um, there is like, for example, uh, the this version, LP something eight, um, which is basically just the drum pads as a MIDI controller, um, but it's purely a USB MIDI controller. So if you wanted to use that with something like the model samples, you'd also have to have a USB host in the mix, which could be like a laptop or a phone or something, but it's just making it more complicated. It's making the whole setup more complicated. I like that these two will just talk directly over MIDI. So for me, um, the extra money uh, to have you know a, a native five pin style or TRS style MIDI port instead of USB MIDI was totally worth it. Now, the fact that this thing also is a sound maker, a sample player to me is just kind of like icing on the cake frankly, I'm probably not going to use this as a sound maker very much, but um, I, I like that it's there if I want to start exploring that. That could be another way of using these two side pads, right? Maybe I have these six mapped to the model samples, and then these two are playing actually internal samples from in here. There is an option on this, by the way, where you can, um, oops, 
well, whatever, I chose a different note accidentally, but uh, if I go to choosing my sample, there is a no sample option, right? So you can have all these pads mapped to no sample. Uh, so you can have sound coming out of this where most of your pads are on no sample and then maybe one or two do have a sample loaded. So there's definitely a way of doing like a hybrid instrument kind of thing like that, which, which would be cool, I think. And I might experiment with that. Um, so let's see, what else I want to talk about? So if you want to do this with the Volca sample, which I think is another strong contender here, because of course it has no, it really has no drum pads at all. It just has these touch pads that are kind of on or off. There's no velocity. Um, it'll still totally work. You're just going to need Pageant's firmware on here, which frankly you should have anyway, because it just makes it so much of a better instrument. Um, but so you're going to need Pageant's custom firmware, and you're also going to need one of these uh, TRS2 full-size MIDI adapters. Um, type A, you want type A. That's what this, that's what the MPX-8 is putting out, is type A of TRS2 5-pin MIDI. A type B adapter will not work, don't use it. So um, you wanna plug this in. By the way, these things should cost you about $5. Um, if, you're, if you're in the US, I know Perfect Circuit sells some good ones for about $5 each plus some shipping. Uh, that's, that's what you should be paying for these. If you're paying much more than that, you're getting ripped off and don't buy these on Amazon because they're always mislabeled and they don't work and it just, it's a pain. Buy them from a reputable music store. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's just going to be, you know, this guy in here with a standard MIDI cable going out there. And I haven't explored that yet, but I will soon. It should work. Um, I will also mention the, just cause I have it right here, the innovation circuit, um, or the new circuit tracks should also be options for this, right? It also uses um, TRS MIDI, which is great. The problem is the circuit uses type B MIDI, not type A. And again, this is outputting type A. So if I just run a cable like this into the circuit, it will not work, um, unfortunately. So what you have to do is make your own custom cable where basically on this, the TRS tip ring sleeve, you need to go from the tip on one end of the cable to the ring on the other end, you need to swap them. So tip on one end to ring on the other end and vice versa, ring on this end to tip on the other end. Now, if you're gonna make your own, you can definitely make your own cable and it's not that hard um, if you have some abilities in that sense. But if you don't have those abilities, there's a kind of easy workaround. Okay, if you don't have the ability to make your own cable, go to your local thrift store and buy two of these cables, right? These are super common because they're used in all sorts of AV systems, right? So this is TRS 8th inch on one side to uh, you know RCA red and white on the other side. You want two of these, and then you want to get one of these little coupler pieces to put them together. And all you have to do is swap the red and the white, just mismatch them. So red goes to white and white goes to red in that little coupler piece. And boom, there you go. That is now a TRS type A to TRS type B MIDI adapter. <laughs> um, it's a, uh, yeah. So that's that. Um, in general though, this should uh, be super fun. Oh, I will say the other way to do it is to have like two of these things where we have TRS type A, a standard MIDI cable, and then a TRS type B, like these are the ones that come with the circuit. That should work. Um, it's just a lot heftier and a lot, I mean, it can be more expensive if you don't have these things already. So it's more annoying, but that should also work if this is the stuff you already have. Okay, um, so yeah, let's, uh, I don't know, let's just close it out with some other new kind of little jam thingy thingy. Oh, notice uh, when I set this one to no sample, it went dark. It's not, it's not lit up orange like the others. So that could be a way, if you are only using some of the pads and not all eight, you know, you can have two of them be dark. Uh, to remind you to not tap them, which might be nice. Um, I will say one one cool thing about the MPX-8, like if you are using it as an internal sound maker, if you're playing a longer sample from it, it actually stays green the entire time the sample is playing versus, like in this case, you can't hear them because I don't have any audio plugged in, but this is a clap. Here, let me just turn this off for a sec so you're not getting confused. This is a clap and this is a crash. So the clap is just like an instantaneous, you know, quick little sound, and the crash is a pshh, so it rings out for a bit. So see how this one is green for an instant, and this one's green for a length of time, which can be super cool if you wanted to load like longer samples into here. Like let's say you had some sort of like a 20 second loop or something you wanted to load into here. Again, do your research. It's, it's a super long loading time to go from the SD card into the internal memory to play that back. So it's, uh, 
it's kind of a frustrating thing if you want to do that, but you can, right? So I could have like these two pads, say be like, you know, 10 or 20 second uh, samples that I could loop if I wanted, or I could have them as one shots, um, or I could hold where you press and hold. And as long as you're holding, the sample plays, and then as soon as you let go, it stops. That, that all those are options inside here. So I could have these two pads be playing internal long samples while I kind of like finger drum with the model samples or the vocal or whatever on top of that. So I think that's a pretty interesting thing uh, that I'll test out. And so that little feature of it staying green for the length of the sample, I think is a pretty cool idea. Um, unfortunately, that does not map out to your MIDI stuff whatsoever. So the length of these staying green has nothing to do with it sending MIDI signals. So um, in that sense, it's unrelated for here. But. So uh, let's take out my metronome again. See if I'm getting any velocity here. Oh yeah, 57, 127, 91, 127, 127. Okay. And keep in mind, you can use this as much as you want too. It's fun. Let's add some of that. <laughs> Not quite. Okay. okay so I kind of missed my last note there. Let's do that one again. All right, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there it is. That's uh, how you can get some decent quality drum pads on something that is missing them. So this this really should work for, you know, pretty much everything. Higher end stuff too, like Digitact and Octatract and stuff like that. Um, all the Volcas this will work for. Um, I mean, just basically anything that does MIDI, uh, you should be able to make this work. So again, the key with this is that auto channel MIDI 10. You have to use ch channel 10 because that's the only thing that the MPX-8 will output. Um, so that means uh, if you're using channel 10 for anything else in your setup, well, too bad. You need to clear it out and use it purely for this. But I will say that, uh, you know, Akai and Electron and, well, not Korg exactly, but Pagin who wrote the software that makes this thing better, um, all agree that channel 10 is kind of the, the default uh, for drum machines. So maybe it's kind of an industry standard thing. Um, it, it certainly works well in my setup. I, I'm really enjoying this little combo of these two. Um, this is, it's super portable, you know, um, easily, easy to battery power. Um, I, like I said, retail price on this, 110, I think maybe is a little bit steep for what it is. I got mine for about 60 bucks used on eBay. And for that price, yeah. Absolutely. This is absolutely worth 60 bucks in my rig um, just to give me the ability to be more expressive with how I'm playing in my drum sequences and that kind of stuff. And I still do use all the, the model samples stuff too. Like for example, let's go here, you know, I'll add a retrig onto here. Let's make it something super fast because I like that. So now if I'm playing in... Right? That's where I find these pads on the model samples to really excel. Don't think of them as drum pads because they're terrible as drum pads. Think of them as pressure pads. Right? So you just, just kind of lean into it a little bit and you can get these cool little rolls and stuff using the retrig always on function. So, right, I can have this. 
as my live drum pad. Right, use, the, use them together. I, th I think there's a lot, uh, a lot to be said for this kind of a setup. Cool, well, uh, that's all I got. Hope you enjoyed it. Cheers.